Hello, one, two. Good evening, comrades, and uh, welcome to the Moth Club. Tonight is a very special uh, event. Uh, it's a spin off event of the Monthly Digestif, which is a weekly news review. I am Sydney Lima, a writer and documentary filmmaker, and I'm very, very excited to introduce to the stage Slavoj Zizek. What do you think? Nice. I've got your favourite. Yeah. Yeah. I'm changing to Fanta. I know. It's a pure provocation. I'm not kidding. You know, some of you must know, what is the origin of Fanta? Fanta is Hitler's answer to Coke. Because in 39, the war, uh, Coke took the copyright, or whatever you call it, licence from Germany, and in one month they invented Fanta. So just be aware when you drink Fanta. So I was going to say, how are you? <laughs> Unfortunately, still alive. So that's still all alive. I can say. Uh, congratulations, another book? Too many of them, I know, yeah. <laughs> um, so you've been labelled a celebrity philosopher, the most dangerous philosopher in the West, a rock star philosopher, a communist, a punk icon, the Elvis of cultural theory, yeah. and most recently, a TikTok hero. How do these titles sit with you? I think, as a good Stalinist paranoiac, that these are all forms of attacking me. <laughs> Even if they, this appears to celebrate me, but the idea is, he's just a popular figure, go to his talk, be amused, but... Don't take him seriously, no? On the, on, on the, in my actual life, if there is something like this, I'm now more and more returning to great philosophical questions. What? Sorry. 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 Oh, yeah. that, that fucks, yeah, you know what that fucks my next question. Now. You will be terribly disappointed. I will not boast with names, but I'm, sorry, I'm in contact with uh, many great names. Uh, I don't know why they are so stupid to accept to be in contact with me, of uh, quantum physics. Like, what does it mean for our notion of reality? What's the status of all those wave oscillations and so on? And I think this is truly fascinating. So I'm deep in that now. And my next book will probably be on that. You can't talk about the next book. We're trying to sell this one. Um, so <laughs> but so this one is... Ah, this one also has a chapter. <laughs> Second one, even. A uh, third one, which is on quantum physics. So you've previously said the only way really to be an atheist is through Christianity. Please explain. I can, as briefly as possible, of course, because, you know, to truly be an atheist... It's not enough to just say there is no God, blah, blah, blah. If you just do this, then God usually survives in some different form. Like you say, there is no personal God, but there are the divine ideals and so on. We should remain faithful to that. And so uh, my idea is that to be really an atheist means to, as it were, self-destroy religion from inside. Did you see, for example, one of my favorite movies, I don't know if I mention it in this book again, uh, I think it's called, uh, it's called Rapture, 30 years ago done with Mimi Rogers, and it's an incredible movie. Uh, I will not tell the entire story, but at the end, a woman who suffers a lot, her children are dead and so on. Uh, what happens is that the end of the world effectively happens. And he goes to the edge of a certain precipice. It's clear that on the other side, it's already heaven. And her child and husband approach her and say, just say, I love you. Christ and you will be permitted to cross over and God exists I mean you see it all and she says no after all the evil that God did to me 
I will never say this. God is too evil. And uh, 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 her daughter, child, dad asked her, but you know what this means? Like, we will never meet. And she said, yes, I know. The end of the movie. You know, this is a much more <laughs> radical position. And I think that <laughs> something like this happens uniquely in Christianity. I think the whole content of Christianity is the death of God, but not in this cyclical sense of God dies and comes back and so on. As Hegel, my favorite philosopher, put it, what dies on the cross is not just a representative of God, but God of beyond himself dies on the cross. What survives is what? It is simply uh, 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 what? Holy Spirit, which is for me the first form of a communist party. It is a community of believers, which, and this is how I read all those details. You remember when Christ says, if you don't hate your father and mother, you are not my follower. How are we to read this? Not in this stupid way. Hate your father or mother as a person. It means mother and father stand there simply for social hierarchies. You can love them, but not in their symbolic role in social hierarchy. So, uh, but Christ says this. You remember when he is, I don't know in which gospel, in a tent, and they, somebody tells him, you know, your family mother who is outside waiting for you, and she says, sorry, he, Christ says, listen, uh, uh, here is my family, my followers. I don't have any family, and so on. This is quite a unique idea, Holy Spirit. And Christ returns in Holy Spirit. Spirit. You, all this topic of second coming, blah, blah, that's bullshit. Read the gospel, yes, where Christ is asked, how will we know after your death that you will return? And he says, when there will be love between two of you, I will be there. And that's it. Nothing, nothing more. So I think, to cut a long story short, that the whole history of Christianity is one big struggle against the truly subversive core of uh, Christianity. I think I often, maybe if some of you know my books, quote this anecdote, which is not true, it's proven, but you know when Napoleon was approached by Pope to be crowned in, uh, in Notre Dame, the church, he took the crown from Pope's hand and put it himself on his head. And that's a myth, but it's a beautiful myth. Then the Pope told Napoleon, I know what you want to do. You want to destroy Christianity, but believe me, you will fail. We, the church, are trying to do this already for almost 2,000 years. And <laughs> we failed. I simply believe that there is something truly traumatic in this original message of Christianity. My favorite theologist, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, said this, he said that, you know, that moment on the cross when Christ says, Eli, Eli, Father, why have you forsaken me? No, that it's the unique moment where God himself, Christ, no longer believes in himself. God becomes an atheist at the end. And that's it, the, the freedom that is given to us as Christians is just this negative freedom. It means the core of Christianity is for me, there is no higher force which takes care of us so that we can be sure that at the end everything will turn well. No, history is radically open. It all depends on us. And I think this especially is important today when we no longer can afford to think in these eschatological terms, you know, the terms of where the history is moving and so on. It's clear that we are in a mess. Even the Marxist solution, history is nonetheless moving towards some kind of a socialism, communism, I think it no longer holds. Even the idea of a privileged class or group of people which are in their very 
social position put constructed as potential fighters for emancipation. Like for Marx, it was the working class. In 68, it was students. Today, some people think it is the, the, the immigrants, like those who are deprived of everything and will do the freedom. No, I think we are in such a mess today that, for example, I think that, that, uh, I think that, uh, that there are all forms of, for example, of unseen, unpaid labor, precarious workers, women, like in Latin America, that's why Evo Morales, I am very friendly with his ex-vice president, uh, Linera, who explained it to me, in old days the left there was focusing on traditional working class. But Linera and Morales got it. What about all those in women working as servants, you know, and so on? Nobody counted on them, but they were the truly exploited. And uh, here, I think, Christianity survives, but not as a positive solution, just as up accepting this abyss. The second reason I like Christianity, trigger warning now, an obscenity will come, no, is that people forget that in Palestine, all are not Muslims. There are also, now there are just 5% of them Christian Palestinians. The best jokes that I've heard but they are, I think, deeply Christian, making fun of Christianity itself. I heard them from Christian Palestinians there, like the, the nastiest one almost. The <laughs> Christ, his last evening there, no, he knows he will be crucified next day, is alone in the tent. So his apostles, disciples said, my God, our Lord will die tomorrow. Why don't we make last mo his last moments happy? and call Mary Magdalene, who was a prostitute, like, go eat and seduce him, that he will have some pleasure. No, okay. She goes in and runs out after two, three minutes, crying like crazy. And they <laughs> ask, in, we're worried, my God, what did he do? Is he secretly a pervert? Did he torture me? <laughs> no, she says, it's much worse. I did what was expected of me. I undressed myself, I spread my legs and approached him. And then Christ look at me, at that area, and says, my God, what a terrible wound I see there, and crossed with his fingers and closed everything. <laughs> right? This is the spirit of Christianity, I claim. If a religion doesn't, doesn't sustain this, you know my favorite philosopher, uh, theologist, Kierkegaard, said this beautifully. You know how he described Kierkegaard, the arrival of Christ? He says, Imagine a big state where you expect some royal figure to emerge and then the curtain open and you see nothing just from behind the curtain, a small dirty dog runs on the stage. That's the arrival of Christ. That's the whole point of it. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. So don't be afraid. I mean, I'm not in any sense returning to church. I think that if anything, what I cannot talk about other kinds, but I coming to, I'm coming from Slovenia where we are a Catholic country. If nothing else, all these pedophiliac scandals are so unthinkable. You know what's the biggest mystery for me? How can the Catholic Church, okay, now the Pope tries to be a little bit better, but nonetheless, how can they at the same time protect <coughs> the pedophilia priests and at the same time uh, 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 criticize homosexuality. As a Croat gay activist, my friend said, ah, now I understand the church position. Adult men shouldn't do among themselves. But if you do it with a small child, everything is okay, <laughs> you know. It's the position of the, of the church is so, is so weakened but I don't think this will hurt this, what I call emancipatory core of Christianity. Okay, I've spoken long enough. No, now we'll be it. shorter. Um, on the subject of Christianity, what's your take on Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson saying the Bible is the foundation of truth? I, listen, 
I know the guy that you mentioned. <laughs> I had so-called debate with him where I was very soft of him, but you know why? Because again, as I said a couple of times, I, uh, my point was to address his followers and to tell them what Jordan is telling you. Don't fall into this self-pitying, victim could stance, take your faith into your hands and so on. We authentic left can deliver this to you better than all the conservatives, you know. And this is part of my larger, totally crazy argument. We live in a crazy time. Did you notice how in last decades with the new right-wing populism, what once we experienced as subversive revolutionary activity is becoming also an almost a right-wing prerogative. I mean, the last thing that looked, although it was not, as a revolutionary act, you remember 6th of January, attack on Capitol. My friends were crying. They said, we should be doing this. People <laughs> invading the city. No, sorry, which is why when I'm asked about this, I'm saying something very simple. I'm saying, you know, neoconservatives like to attack multiculturalism, uh, uh, liberal obscenity, cynicism, historicism. No, if there ever was a postmodern president, it is Donald Trump. He's an obscene guy. He doesn't take seriously him. You've spoken very highly of him recently. When? Where? <laughs> Show me. Where? Where? No, 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 because my point is, this one, that uh, if you, isn't it paradoxical that he, with all his dirty things and so on, he is the true postmodern relativist. And what is Bernie Sanders, in spite of all critical points, isn't he a pure figure of what you cannot but call simple, silent, decency, moral majority even, and so on. It's, the system is so decadent today that it is up to us, whatever survive of the left, to speak about common decency and so on and so on. We live in crazy times. In a new text that I don't know when it will appear, where I speak about the most tragic country at this point, for me, on the world. Not Ukraine, not Gaza, but, uh, uh, but Haiti. Do you read what is happening there? The gangs, criminal gangs, simply took over the country. They control 80% of the Port-au-Prince capital uh, and so on. So now you will say, okay, Haiti, blah, blah. Uh, let's move further in El Salvador, in Ecuador, something similar is happening. Let's go further in, uh, in uh, other places like from uh, Israel, settlers on the West Bank, aren't they also? They are basically a criminal gang, illeg operating illegally and supported by the police. Why? Because you know who is now their chief of police, Itamar Ben-Gvir, who was in Israel itself 20, 30 years ago convicted as a terrorist against Palestinians. Then we can go on with all these examples up to, of course, uh, United States, proud boys, terrorists, but collaborating with Trump. So the situation in which we are now, it looks as if the new political rulers cannot survive without some form of illegal criminal gang support. And I think we should not miss this opportunity to get the message to ordinary people. Those who present themselves as advocates of neoconservative Christian values, the other face of them is always vulgar, brutal criminality. So what are you suggesting? Is this when we've spoken about this before about war communism? No, with war communism, I mean something, okay, I mean to provoke, obviously, but to make people think. With war communism, I mean something extremely simple, for me, almost commonsensical. War, why war communism? Because we are entering a new global emergency state. 
We in Western Europe are still playing this game. We are not taking crisis, the forthcoming crisis seriously enough. Our problem is still, yeah, let's do some ecological stuff. Yeah, let's do a little bit of support for Ukraine here, there. But basically, we, the main goal is to maintain our level, our style of, our level of relatively comfortable, still relatively, poverty is now exploding also in Western Europe, uh, <coughs> level of life. And I think as long as we will drag on with this attitude, we are lost. We are, uh, you know what gave me this idea? The first, remember two and a half years ago, I think, the summer, our beloved places, Seattle and so on, no? You remember temperatures were there, Seattle and Vancouver, for a, one week, almost 50 degrees Celsius. Vancouver was hotter, more warm than, than, than Gulf State, than Emirates and so on. Why? You cannot solve this as a local problem. You know, like, uh, uh, no, because measured by our ecological standards, they were doing a relatively good job there. It's the perturbation of air around the entire northern area is disturbed. If you take into account this, if you take into account all the problems of immigration, new wars and so on, only some sort of communism, this is elementary for me, and by communism I mean much end of nation states, potentially, much closer international cooperation. It's clear, for example, I spoke with my good friend Jean-Pierre Dupuy, who is the greatest today, I think, theorist of catastrophes. He visited Fukushima as a special envoy of European Union two days after the Fukushima tragedy. And the Japanese government representative admitted to him that the Japanese government was for one day in a total panic. They thought the whole central area of Japan, 40 million people, will have to be evacuated. Well, in a more collaborative world order, the answer is clear, Siberia, with more than enough space. No, it would not happen. We will need or immigration. I hate this liberal approach, open the borders. Yes, but it's not enough. We have to begin now to change the economic system, not in a utopian way, but just to prevent immigrants. Why do people leave their country? What pushes them? There, this is where we are, we in the West are guilty. All these stupidities. You know that without, without American attack on Iraq and Russian meddling in Syria, there wouldn't have been ISIS and so on. The other mega mistake, the toppling of Gaddafi and so on. If we don't begin to think in these terms, uh, we are lost. And my prediction is here pretty pessimist, that we didn't yet suffer enough. We need a catastrophe which will make us aware of the shit we are in. Oh. Yeah, but it's, we are, don't you think that? I know it's sad, I know, no, we still will have a meaningful life and so on. We will hopefully not starve, but we need, listen, uh, you know why I like epidemic, why I like that uh, pandemic crisis? Because even guys who were definitely not good guys, Boris Johnson here and Trump, even they were compelled to do some things which violated the market rules so much that they could be characterized as elementary forms of communism, like, you know, uh, uh, free distribution of money, of help to millions of people. Of course, they immediately twisted it and went to the big companies and so on and so on. But what were, you, what were you doing in the pandemic? Sorry? What were you doing in the pandemic? Uh, now we come to my private obscenity. It was the best years, <laughs> the best years of my life. Banana bread. <laughs> because for two, three years I stayed at home, I was able to ignore all my friends, <laughs> and I was just watching old, mostly British, detective criminal series. Which ones? Uh, 
it's, okay, it's too politically correct to say Vera, but Lin Li, all those, you know. Uh, uh, I, just, uh, I was watching this and good science fiction series, and I was working like crazy. I loved it immensely. I was <laughs> able, because I hate, in my old age, I'm getting really like hating people in general. Especially people who think, oh, let's visit him and so on. Fuck you, I have more serious <laughs> work to do, you know? I don't like people too much, you know? So I, it was the golden era for me. Um, you recently had an interview with Piers Morgan, who you actually got on with a bit. Maybe I, again, I <laughs> followed my uh, uh, Jordan Peterson tactic uh, yeah. too much, but I just wanted to get through this basic message, for example, about Gaza and so on, you know. I still think that, and this is one thing that I am really proud of, a piece of fiction that I imagined, an imagined phone call about between Hamas and Israelis. Did you see the movie, did you see the movie Ghost, Ghost Writer? with Ewan McGregor, an investigator who investigates uh, a figure who is named differently, but basically it's Tony Blair. And at the end he is killed because he discovers a secret that Tony Blair was from his student years coached by CIA to become a pro-American prime minister of the United States. It's a fiction, but it's a beautiful fiction which would have explained everything. <laughs> and my theory is that to get the logic at what goes on in the Middle East, imagine a phone call from hardliners in Israel and uh, Hamas. They call hardliner from Israeli government Hamas. Hi, you remember that we supported you all these years, which is true, are you aware of it? Till two years ago, Israel was regularly through Qatar supporting Hamas. You have proofs, you have Smotrich, their crazy, totally right-wing minister admitting it. What was the game? The game was Palestinians must be divided. As long as Gaza is separated politically from the West Bank, there will not be serious pressure for a two-state solution. So the Israelis said, now we have to ask you a favor. Could you please attack ferociously some of our settlements there, close to Gaza. And Hamas said, surprisingly, why? Israel explained to him, we have now two problems in Israel. A, uh, you know, remember, just before October 7th, wonderful things were happening in Israel. Hundreds of thousands were demonstrating against Netanyahu, who wanted to abolish the relative independence of the Supreme Court, all that. And this was a problem, and they needed a war, Netanyahu regime, to survive. There are many mysterious things which confirm suspicions in this. But I will not go into them. What I want to send, uh, the Netanyahu hardliner tells Hamas, another problem we have is West Bank. You know, that we want to do ethnic cleansing there. But if we don't have a military crisis, we cannot strengthen settlers to perch Palestinians there. Hamas said, okay, we will do this gladly, but uh, in, are you aware that this, why this fits us? Because when you will attack us ferociously, uh, anti-Semitism will explode, not only in the Arab countries, but also elsewhere. And the Israeli hardliner says, that's wonderful, because when there is stronger anti-Semitism, we can say we must fight it and become even more militarily aggressive. And they, they conclude the conversation by saying, you know, the last lines of uh, Casablanca. They turn it around and this is the beginning of a beautiful hatred, something like that. <laughs> and I really think that they have a deadly tango, Hamas and, uh, and, and, uh, and the hardliners who are crazy. If you read in some of my texts, I discovered, if you want to, the truth about what is today's Israeli politics. Google Eli, E-L-I, Academy, 
which is the hardline academy, but not marginal. People who collaborate with it are Netanyahu, Smotrich, and so on. And, uh, and uh, Channel 13, which is the most open public Israeli TV channel, published a report on it where some rabbis explain exactly what they want. They, it's not a joke. And I checked with all of my friends in Israel. They confirmed it. Uh, rabbis are there saying this. I will skip the open racism, like, uh, 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 like that uh, Palestinians are people who are by nature slaves. They need to be enslaved to be happy and so on. The crucial point is when it comes to Nazism. A rabbi said Hitler was the greatest ethical figure of the 20th century. He had the right principle. He says the true Holocaust is not the one done by Germans. The true Holocaust is multiculturalism. So we need, Hitler was right. He just made the mistake of picking up the wrong people. He should have picked up uh, uh, <laughs> Arabs, not the Jews, but then comes the ingenious point. They said, but even like this, Hitler was right, because he was a divine instrument. The Jews got to integrate into Western Europe, and Hitler was an instrument of God, Jewish God, to recall, to remind Israelis, Jews, sorry, that it's their time to go out of Europe and return to the West Bank. I was shocked. I thought this is a bad joke. Then I checked through all my friends, Jewish friends in Israel. They confirmed this to me. Of course, this is a minority view, but it is a minority view which uh, determines the actual politics of Israel. Do you know that now, did you see, it's very sad. The last opinion poll, 93% of Jews in Israel are opposed to two-state solution. They accept their version of from the river to the sea, which is great Israel and so on. I mean, it's, uh, you know whom I only trust there? Please uh, 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 Google him. Uh, Avi or Ami Ayalan, ex-boss of Shin Bet, who is the voice of reason now. They, he says, if we don't give Palestinians real hope for political autonomy and so on, then we are lost. And he openly says, he proposes a solution which is clear. Immediately released from prison, uh, uh, how is it called? Marvan Bar Barguti, I think, no? That it, it's, he's a Palestinian Mandela. He never was for killing Jews, violence, but he was the organizer of first two intifadas, and he's already in prison for, prison for almost 20 years. And he's really a Palestinian Mandela, and he is the only one with enough popular support and ready to make peace. Everybody knows that this is, a, all reasonable people know that this is, a, so it's not a mystery what to do, but I think we live in times of gang rule and so on, where I expect, I pre, I'll put it like this to conclude. I, I prefer to be a pessimist, because if you are an optimist today, you are just disappointed all the time. But if you are a pessimist, from time to time, some nice thing nonetheless happens, no? So the only way to happiness is to be a pessimist and then to be <laughs> pleasantly uh, surprised. Well, wise words. <laughs> no, no, don't. I hate wisdom. You know, <laughs> that's my old story. You know what is wisdom? I hate it so much. Wisdom is this platitude where whatever the situation is, you can add a wise comment. You know, once I took an example, you do something risky. And if you succeed, then I'm sure you can instantly quote some wisdom to justify it. No, like we have this. Those who don't risk ne also never profit. Or you have the whole series of wise saying, then let's say you make the same risk, but you fail. I don't know how it is with you, but in my country, we have a wonderful vulgar expression, which is, uh, you cannot urinate against the wind. <laughs> so 
you see, whatever you do, I will find a wisdom to, to justify it. No, I think we need more madness today. Just not wisdom. Yeah. Why? Yeah. <laughs> um, you recently wrote an article about Barbie, um, but you hadn't seen the film. Um, wha <laughs> why? <laughs> it's a, uh, after, after I'm a principal guy, I already told you, my, when I write reviews, my motto is what I think, so I read, uh, Oscar Wilde wrote somewhere that when you're asked to do a review of a book, it's better not to read that book, because if you read it, actually, it may make your judgment partial. <laughs> I feel like everyone should do that at school. Sorry? Everyone should just do that at school then. Yeah, so again, uh, I'm not saying it's a totally bad movie, and I like Greta Gerwig, no, the director, her previous work. But something, you know what should be made more clear? I will put a very simple formula. <coughs> that the world of Barbie is really hell. And the, this asexual world and so on. And uh, the true problem is why we ordinary people need to fantasize about hell. It, I would make it much darker. Uh, the other movie I also had problems with, but there I made a crucial mistake. I actually saw it. It's, oh. it's Oppenheimer. Yeah. <laughs> you must have read what I wrote about it. it no, it, I, it's not a bad movie, but I hate that pseudo-oriental mystical part, you know, quoting Bhagavad Gita and oh, now I'm a destroyer of the world, it's bullshit. My favorite scene, and at the same time, worst scene in the movie is, you remember, and maybe you know my story, which is I got in big trouble in India, I was told by friends, because you remember, water uh, of an hour early in the movie, there is a sex scene between Oppenheimer and Gene Tetlock, played by yeah, uh, Florian. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, the catch is that in the middle of the sex, I don't know who asked whom read Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> and Indians serially protested, demanding that scene to be cut. No? The idea is dirty sex out of not even, they are not married. How can you mix this with the sacred book? Then I did a crazy thing. I said I agree with this incompatibility, but from the other side. Why not say like this? A beautiful sex scene ruined by one of the most obscene books in the history of humanity. <laughs> Bhagavad Gita is hell. You know my story, why? I'm not kidding. I read me biography of Heinrich Himmler, SS and so on. This was his sacred book. He always had in his pocket a specially bound uh, uh, book, uh, Bhagavad Gita. You know why? Himmler had, I'm sorry to use this term, an ethical problem. He was well aware that uh, SS guys have to do horrible things. Killing Jewish uh, 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 women, children who are starving, crying. And Himmler's problem was, how can they do it without becoming devious, ugly with, uh, themselves, without losing their decency? And his answer was Bhagavad Gita. You remember the central scene where this idea of acting as a, at a distance is developed, this notion, like, don't identify with your acts. You have to do horrible things, but do it at a distance. And uh, this is why, maybe I hope I'm not uh, uh, offending any of you, I prefer the Christian ethics, which is for me the ethics of external engagement, like fuck you and your inner life. I don't care what is there. If I look deep into you, I will find shit. I'm a pessimist here. There is no deep core of goodness in you. The, and, uh, the important thing is that the truth about you is not in what you fantasize, your ethical ideas and so on. They are, as a rule, a fake story you invented so that you can survive, deal with the horrors that you do in your actual life.
what matters, like, what was that truth, that series, I forgot, uh, 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 of alien invasions, where uh, the motto was, uh, uh, the truth is out there. It's not insight. Don't look deep into yourself for truth. So this spoiled Oppenheimer for me a little bit. So no, none of these movies I, I really liked. I'm a little bit, but not quite. Did you see most more kindly disposed towards the zone of interest? I love some disturbingly vulgar, although not explicitly shown, details. You remember, if you saw the movie, how the guy, this uh, Nazi commander, the <laughs> hero, uh, they bring to him some pale woman, obviously for sex, and of course then they don't show sex, they just show him from behind, standing in front of a wash basin and in such a vulgar detailed way, washing his genitals, like to get, I, there is something nice, not to mention the heroic act the director did at Oscar, no? Yes. Yeah, I mean, this is, I know people who know him, and they will put even me in contact with him. And I admire him, you know why? Because they told me. Have you me. spoken to him? Sorry? Have you spoken to him? Not yet. I hope it's justified to say yet. But what I heard is that he was, although not religious, explicitly deeply into Jewish spirituality, let's call it. And uh, even when the Hamas attack triggered this crisis, he was first tempted a little bit by blah, blah, uh, 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 Israeli, we are in danger, patriotism. But then when he saw Gaza, he exploded. And he was honest enough, precisely as remaining faithful to Jewish tradition, saying, sorry, I cannot, I have to renounce it. What we are doing in Gaza is, is a total nightmare and you, I don't know how much it is supported here, but I just wonder if he will survive, if, if he will get money for next films and so on. No, you, they, no, cut, no. they cut that scene, they, they cut his acceptance speech from the rerun of the Oscars. Really? Yeah. They did it? Yeah. My God, this is so horrible. This is why in another of my recent texts, I, I, uh, called for a cultural boycott, at least, of Germany. What is happening now in Germany is obscene. You know that they have now such strict standards. For example, if you say Palestinians suffer, and if you don't say in the same sentence, but this suffering was caused by Hamas, so it's basically Hamas which is responsible, not Israel, uh, you are considered already, it's not a joke, you are considered anti-Semitic. And uh, 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 so now a friend of mine made a statistic, a little bit over 1,000 people were uh, seriously affected by this campaign against what they call anti-Semitism, uh, like losing their job, being canceled and so on in public life. But you know the true horror? One third of them are Jews. As a friend of mine said, now the most difficult thing in Germany is not to be a Muslim or Palestinian, it's to be a Jew who is critical of Israel. Why? Typically, because if you are Palestinian, they say, okay, you are one of the, that ban bunch, you know, <laughs> of course you are. But if you are a Jew, you are considered, who is critical of Israel, you are considered an ultra traitor and so on. What is happening now in Germany is, I think, the nastiest ethical act, as many people noted, that you can imagine. It's Germans guilty of killing millions of Jews are offering the state of Israel an extremely brutal exchange, like uh, as an admission of our guilt we now try to repay you for allowing you to do a similar thing that we were doing to others, you know. It's the worst possible thing that they can do. It's absolutely incredible what is happening now in Germany. And 
After I caused, I will not bore you now with it, a scandal when at the opening of the Frankfurt Book Fair, where I just mentioned also suffering of Palestinians, I was interrupted, some local politicians started to shout at me and so on. Uh, uh, then friends told me, wait one month, two, it will be over. No, it's even <coughs> getting uh, worse now. And I think, just that I finish this line, you know whom I, who I think proposed the right formula? You know that Indian writer uh, 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 Arundhati Roy? Yeah, he uh, made a wonderful comment where he said, till Gaza, we all knew that so-called Western values, emancipatory values, human rights, freedoms, feminism, were a fake, hypocritical, <laughs> but still they did provide some kind of moral compass. Like, you could even criticize the West, you know, say, ah, you preach this, but you yourself don't stick to it. Like, they gave some kind of, and she said, with Gaza, what's going on there now? The whole European legacy lost its emancipatory potential. And to make a philosophical point, a little bit more serious, if you allow me, you know who was the biggest disappointment for me? Uh, Habermas and two of his closest collaborators. They, from my private spy sources, I learned, having me in mind, they published a short text totally legitimizing uh, Israel, claiming, no, we must unconditionally stand with Israel they published this text in December or January, when the killing in Gaza went on. But what I want to say is that as other more reasonable followers of Frankfurt School said, you know what's the problem with Habermas? He never accepted, I think, the most truthful part of the previous generation of Frankfurt theory, the so-called dialectic of enlightenment, Aufklärung. The idea being that horrible phenomena of 20th century, like fascism, Stalinism, and so on, are not simply remainders of some earlier barbarism, but are generated by the very dynamic of enlightenment-style modernization of Europe. And Habermas never accepted this. His idea is no. Enlightenment is the only thing we have. We can, no self-criticism of enlightenment is allowable. The only thing we could do is to point out that enlightenment is not yet radicalized enough. And I think that this is a horror, that the philosopher who is now practically a German state philosopher, celebrated as the high point of Western tolerance, culture, and so on, that, uh, uh, ended up, again, uh, ended up defending what Israel is doing now. As some critics put it in wonderful terms, critics of Habermas, uh, referring to Walter Benjamin, you can only be a ci truly civilized person today if you are aware that we are on the edge of barbarism, which doesn't come from outside, but from inner tensions of our own European project. If we don't do this, we are lost. I talk too much, sorry. I like how that was an answer to a question about Barbie. About? Barbie. <laughs> this was all really about Barbie, because Habermas is a philosophical Barbie. You want me to say, to say this? Um, I'm going to open this up to the audience for questions. If you want to put your hands up, I'm going to come around with a, uh, another mic. Ah, sorry, uh, this one still works. No, 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 I've got, I, I've got one. I know, I know, but I, uh, I, don't like, I don't like to hold this in my hand because it's too masturbatory and so on. Would you like it, would you like it in your hand? Sorry? You, won't, you don't want it in your hand? No, 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 no. I don't think so. Um, hands up, I can't see. I must criticize you. What? Sydney, for your filthy liberalism. Oh. I discovered before that this is a true debate. A good Stalinist would distribute the questions ahead. <laughs> and you said you know that to me before. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Here. 
Um, what's your name? Uh, my name is Umar. I'm from Goldsmiths. Uh, so is there a Jewish atheism? Because the, is there a Jewish atheism? That's, because That's a very good question. And I will give you an answer. I think that, and my friend who is otherwise a right winger, but not an idiot, uh, Peter Sloterdijk, the German one, developed somewhere, I forgot where, a wonderful idea, which is that every great religion has its own specific form of atheism. Islam also have an atheism. It's even pretty respectful. I think it's even in Quran, or I don't know where, where it says that if you believe it or not, Mohammed says this, it's your inner life. I will not mess with that. I just demand to follow the form and so on and so on. And I think that you find in Judaism, my Jewish friends drew my attention to this, elements of atheism uh, in some very interesting parts of uh, Talmud. For example, there is a wonderful passage in Talmud, and it's not a joke. You have two versions of it, where it's wonderful, where God, uh, uh, where, sorry, two rabbis debate about uh, some theological point, doesn't matter. And then the one who is losing said, but let's call God Jehovah. Let him decide. So Jehovah comes and took the side of the guy who was losing the debate. And then the other guy, the more intelligent rabbi, starts to shout at Jehovah, proving him, Jehovah, that he is making a wrong argument. And you know what happens? Jehovah said, oh my God, oh my God, you are right. My pupils are, uh, are brighter than me and runs away. And you have two versions of this. Another, the other version is even more comical and so on. But if you speak about Jewish atheism, you know which is my favorite book from the Old Testament. I'm not very original here. The book of Job, of course. This is for me the first systematic critique of ideology, where you know what happens, but I will not deal with that. Already the beginning is pure obscenity. Uh, God and devil, I don't know who debate behind the table, like, does Job really believe in you or not? And they decide it's extremely obscene that they will deprive him of all his worldly goods, blah, blah, blah. So, okay, you know what happens to Job. He loses his family, all his problems, blah, blah, blah. Okay, then you have three ideologists who came to him. The, to, and they precisely do what ideology is doing. They try to rationalize, justify Job's suffering. The first one says, you think you are innocent, but look deeper into yourself. What if nonetheless you did something evil? The second theology says something like, Me, even if you didn't do anything, maybe this is just uh, God testing. Like, they provide reasons. And then, so this is ideology. Then, then a miracle happens. Uh, again, uh, here now in a better role, Jehovah, or I don't know if God comes and takes Job's sight. He says to Job, what those three theologists were telling is all bullshit. I simplify it. You were totally right in your complaint. Now comes the beautiful moment, true atheism. Then Job asks God, but listen, if you agree with me, then what, what the fuck, why did you make me suffer so much? Now comes the problem. God makes his famous speech, what do you know about, I don't know, he enumerates some strange animals, blah, 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 all the strange, like usually <coughs> God's answer, <coughs> sorry, is read as a, a depiction of irreducible gap between God and our limited human mind. Like we are too stupid to understand God. But my favorite Catholic theologist, Gilbert Chesterton, proposes a totally different reading. That God's answer is, ah, you think I screwed things up with you, 
But look at the world. I screwed up everything. <laughs> All my creation. And this is the deepest insight, which is thinly masked atheism that I find in Talmud and so on. That God, even if God exists, creation is a totally screwed up job, a total failure. So uh, I know I'm simplifying things, but uh, it can be developed much more in uh, much more uh, in detail. So I think that then in Christianity you have other forms of uh, atheism and so on. But I again, I ah, there is another part in Talmud which is also very materialist. It's almost God quoting Marx. <laughs> God says something like, sorry, I don't know specifically, I am aware that I only exist through human pray, praying prayers and celebrating me and so on and so on. So this worth, I'm not able to deliver it, this, is, this deserves a much more detailed uh, study. No, atheism is not a simple, all the time the same, stands it's it's in some sense it's difficult to be truly an atheist for example for me stalinists were not really materialists atheists because you know the whole logic of stalinism was we may be doing horrible things today in purges killing millions but when communism will arrive what we are doing will be retroactively justified that is to say, all the Stalinism is based on this purely theological idea that there is a figure of what Jacques Lacan would have called Big Other, some symbolic agency which guarantees the long-term true meaning of what we are doing. A true materialist must renounce this, I say. Which is why, back to problem of uh, problem of Holocaust. The most disgusting theological metaphor that I can imagine is this idea which I found disgusting that uh, what we mortal humans perceive as, uh, as sin or evil is just, you know, this terrifying metaphor is just like a stain on an image. Take a beautiful image. If you look too close at it, it appears a stain. If you make a couple of steps back, you see that what appeared to you as a stain is really something that contributes to the harmony of the image. I think that the whole point of authentic Judaism and Christianity is that this vulgar theological reasoning should be abandoned. No. When we have extreme human suffering, there is no way to justify it, but oh, it's just our illusion, let's make a step back and justify it. No, suffering is in some sense absolute here. You cannot justify it. But again, I talk too much. And now you move, no, you move from you the right. You can choose. No, oh, no, 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 no. This is the start. from the right to the left, finally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Um, Carl Rogers, the humanist psychologist. I remember him when I was young. Yeah. Okay, right, so... No, no evil men, yeah. With the book, obviously, like, I haven't read it yet, and I don't know how anybody has, but there's the subtitle of How to Be a Real Materialist. Without taking too much time, the way that I kind of see the Carl Rogers thing being applicable to it is the idea of the idealism. So how kind of there's this... I'm trying to keep it short, but... It feels to me more and more culturally in society there's this investing into the idea of idealism in the sense of materialism. So we'll pursue our own self-worth based on material goods, social media, and the kind of, it's an easy target, but the idea of kind of how social media can validate us based on the idealist itself being portrayed out there. I hope this is making some sense. I feel like the counter to the Carl Rogers thing that he talks about is the authenticity of the individual versus the idealism. So what I wanted to know from you is based on the book, and your own kind of opinion, what authenticity is. Because when I see a lot of people speak about it, it tends, from things I've seen, it tends to like blend into spiritualism. And I feel like that's kind of a 
First, interesting perspective uh, you know, what you'd say. Very good question because it's a big sorry, it's a big problem. What uh, do you mean by materialism? I don't mean. First, we have a very primitive notion inherited from uh, 19th century that materialism means that ultimately there is empty space and some small bits of matter <laughs> jumping there up and down. And that all there is is a combination of this small. No, well, here I have no problem with the most speculative quantum mechanics. Ultimately, there is no matter, there are waves or whatever. Ultimately, it's a wonderful thought. Void itself is not really empty. There is a lot of potential in the void. So the first thing to renounce to be truly materialist is this very primitive idea of some, some hard, some tiny bits of real stuff and so on. The second thing, is that for me, and if I interpreted, understood your intention correctly, we are moving in the same direction, it's that, it's that uh, 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 in some sense, brutal materialism can be more spiritual in a false sense than idealism. You know whom I criticize here, although I love him as a movie director, Tarkovsky Stalker. There is a wonderful feature, but I think it's fake. In his movies, you know what I like in Tarkovsky? In his movies, especially Stalker, spiritual experience is not portrayed as you look up from this dirty earth to some up. No, you know, his heroes have, let's call it spiritual experience, when they usually lie in water, dirty water, in a mud, so in this immersion and so on, into it. Then, at the same time, linked to this, uh, German idealists like <coughs> Schelling, more than Hegel, but Hegel also, Schelling puts this in a wonderful way. Somewhere I forgot where, I think in uh, this, his famous short treatise on human freedom. He says that evil is much more spiritual than goodness. Goodness is a natural attitude of respecting natural object, but the br evil is the brutality of destroying materiality, which is much more <coughs> spiritual. So my answer to you would be also, <laughs> What do you mean by idealism? First, my materialism is practically materialism without matter. I would even say, I am, maybe you meant this, oh, materialism of ideas themselves. You know, in the sense of ideas themselves behave as material objects interacting and so on. So I, Sorry, uh, maybe now it's not the time to go to the end. In Shall all I of give this? you his number? Sorry? I'll give you his number. Sorry? Yeah, I'll give you his number. You can talk about it after. <laughs> ah, no, 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 no. I, I wanted to say something dirty like... Oh, okay, you know. okay. <laughs> no, 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 not, I'm, uh, not, not with you. I'm interested. <laughs> but when somebody tells me this, I like to treat in this dirty way, you know, like to say, uh, give me your number and all email and uh, we'll keep in contact and then, you know, at the next corner I throw it away and so on, you know. <laughs> Sorry? No, 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 but, but I honestly am saying now that your question, what is materialism? Uh, sorry, when you said authenticity, you know. Now I will give you the last example where I think authenticity is not go deep into yourself and so on. Yeah, authenticity is, sorry if I repeat an example that I used in some of my old books, among, it's from a Rossellini film, which I of course haven't seen. Uh, <laughs> no, this one I had after yeah. writing about it, uh, General Della Rovere. It's a beautiful movie about uh, ethical awakening. It takes place in 43, I think, in some of those uh, northern Italians still under fascism movies, where the Germans capture a cheap thief and they notice that he is uncannily similar, resembling 
General Della Rovere, who is one of the heroes of anti-fascist resistance. The true general is already dead, but he was killed secretly by the Germans, so all the people they have in prison, resistance fighters, don't know it. So they propose to this guy, played by Vittorio De Sica, a simple task. Go to prison, pretend that you are General Della Rovere, since this is a legendary figure, other prisoners will trust you and will tell you all the details about what they plan, what they plan against uh, us Nazis, Germans. And so if you do this properly, we will discreetly set you free. And then you can imagine what happens. The guy does this and becomes so identified with General Della Rovere that he starts to behave as one and doesn't tell anything to Germans and prefers to be shot by German as General Della. So you see, it's just, it's fully accepting what? What was ultimately a mask. He doesn't go deep into himself. He just accepts, fully identifies with an imposed role. That would be for me close to authenticity, which is the exact opposite of go deep into yourself or whatever. I think we've got to put those hands up. And I think, sorry, thank you for your question. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that we don't have no the numbers, the numbers. time. Yeah. Oh wait, actually, I should probably, oh yeah. Uh, uh, hi, uh, thank you. Uh, I just, um, ah, so I'm there. working on the Kant and I have a, a sort of a, a question related to cosmopolitanism t today and, and, and what potential there is for that, how that would even uh, look today. I, you talk quite a lot about suffering and almost like the need in a perverse way or the potentiality for in that. And I was wondering how maybe that could connect to the possibility for cosmopolitanism today or if you even think that that could be a possibility for a kind of utopian sense of that in, in kind of the idea almost that it's Kant has. Again, sorry, um, finish. Yeah, I'm and sorry. just f finally, in relation to, to suffering, uh, someone who has a similar sort of uh, leaning to you in a way, I mean, certainly in the orientation around Christian atheism, um, Francois Laruelle, I think you wrote an introduction uh, 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 yeah, recently, yeah, 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 yeah. his idea of the, the suffering s subjects, uh, I'm kind of interested in as well. So if, if you could comment on that you too, know, that would be... I have one problem, I don't know if this was your intention, with suffering. Uh, the, the temptation is to elevate suffering itself into a proof of of authenticity. If you suffer, it's authentic. I think this is to be rejected as a perverse uh, trap. But uh, the main point of your question was, sorry, I am losing my mind slowly. The main point of your question was before you can... Uh, uh, cosmopolitanism. cosmopolitanism, yes. You know, uh, I'm, as a Hegelian, again, against abstract cosmopolitanism in the sense of but above all our peculiarities there is some uh, universal feature no we are here at those most disgusting unesco books about world civilization this uh, civilization is this great thing today and no you know what i see as true cosmopolitanism where uh, a certain particular culture can come to itself, can see itself properly only from the outside. Like, it's not that I am me and I can step on my shoulders and see how me and you, if you are from another culture, have nonetheless something in common. No, it's more like, listen, let me give you an example. Uh, 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 Salman Rushdie, I have problems with him. But one story he told at some uh, round table in Basque country uh, of all places where I met him once was a very beautiful one. Maybe you know it. He told there at a round table that uh, he was attacked often as betraying his Indian heritage. No, that he is too much immersed into British white colonial culture. 
And then his answer was a brilliant one. Uh, he said, no, the biggest influence of my work are two great English writers. Sorry, two great Indian writers, Charles Dickens and Jane Austen. And then he gave a wonderful explanation where he says that the poverty, poverty in India today, slums of uh, Mumbai, that is to say Bombay, incidentally, with my evil gaze, I noticed when I was there that all my Indian friends were talking about Bombay. Then I told them, I asked them, but wait a minute, like, isn't it now Mumbai? They told me, oh, that's to annoy you white people from the <laughs> West. <laughs> we are still know it's Bombay. Okay, but, uh, uh, and then he said, of course, that the typical topic of his book, this slightly impoverished lower middle class families where the problem is how you marry your daughter, this is Jane Austen, you know. He has a very nice moment here. His point is this one, that if we read Dickens and Jane Austen today from Indian perspective, Indian, not American Indians, India, India, then uh, incidentally, another point about cosmopolitanism, maybe you know, but it's not a joke. My most beautiful metaphysical experience was in Missoula, Montana, years ago where there were at a round table some Native Americans. I instantly become friendly with them. Sorry, something. Ah, ah sorry, too close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I inst we, you know why? Because there was me, some progressive liberals, blah, blah, uh, and these Native Americans. And they protested, no? They said, we don't... Uh, they refer to themselves as Indians. And then a white liberal said, no, you are humiliating yourself. You are Native Americans. Don't accept this. And then in, uh, the Indian guy, with whom I become friendly, exploded and said, first, we don't like the term Native Americans. Nature versus culture. So you are a cultural American, so what, and we are native. And he said an, an ingenious way. He said, I much prefer to be called Indian because then at least my name is a monument to white man's stupidity. Who thought, you know, they are in India when they... This is true cosmopolitanism, that you see the limitation of the other. So what I want to say is that this is for me true cosmopolitanism. How to understand... People, it's not, you know, this pseudo topic. I'm caught in my culture. How do I know if when I speak with a Chinese guy, if I really understand his culture? No, it's a mistake, because how do I know that I understand my own culture? I need an external gaze. For example, it's a wonderful detail of my beloved Hollywood. The greatest critical films about American everyday life in the 30s, 40s, were made by Fritz Lang, even Hitchcock, and so on, authors who were able to cast, to look at United States from outside. You see, this is for me the true cosmopolitanism, not abstract, or another thing which I find fascinating. I like to take a look at what we consider the greatest work of art and see how their cinema versions are. For example, the best Shakespeare, Hamlet, for me. Forget about all those, Laurence Olivier and so on. You will be surprised. It's for me, Akira Kurosawa, 62, the Japanese version of set in modern Japan, of uh, Hamlet, where it's a wonderful retelling. Hamlet is... Uh, son of a rich American returning from the studies in the United States and sees his father murdered and so on and so on and with a beautiful title only good only evil people sleep well which is deeply true because you know if you are if you sleep bad because you did something evil there is goodness in you if you are truly evil you don't care you sleep well or another example idiot Dostoevsky the best idiot is again Kurosawa from 47. You know, this idea that it's false, this historicism, to know Shakespeare, you must study all the British history in details. No, it's the opposite. 
to really understand Shakespeare, you must erase the peculiarities and look at Shakespeare from outside. And in this sense, you can understand Shakespeare better than Shakespeare himself. And these are, for me, moments of authentic cosmopolitanism, where looking from outside, you see an unexpected universal dimension of a concrete particular work of art. For me, all great things come from this clash of which, which, cultures, which is why, for example, Ireland, for example, although I hate James Joyce, I'm all for Samuel Beckett, but both Beckett and Joyce, you see, to did all great things they did about Ireland. Joyce wrote Ulysses We Know Where, close to my home in Trieste. Beckett had even to change language and write in French and so on. No? So I am not against a, 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 a cosmop I just think that the, uh, there is no authentic cosmopolitanism without, how should I put it, remaining faithful to your particular legacy by betraying it, by looking at it from the outside. In those rare moments, you get authentic cosmopolitanism outside that stupidity of, you know, we are all basically human and... Uh, uh, no, I think that the only true cosmopolitanism is we are both basically evil, but each of us is evil in a specific way. Sorry. <laughs> We got some more questions in this area. Oh, hello. Oh, hi, Sydney. How are you? Great, thanks. Yeah, good. Why um, don't you take a coffee and talk alone? <laughs> 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 and then we can hear go on. <laughs> uh, I, I'm looking for a dummy's guide um, from either of you, really. Um, how to free my mind from ideology. <laughs> uh, first, what do you mean by ideology here? You know, for me, the problem is this, that ideology, that's my motive that I repeat all the time. Ideology is not ideas which dominate us. Ideology is inscribed into our very everyday practice. Even, I like these dirty examples, I will not uh, uh, repeat them now, how we deal with cheat, how we deal with cooking, and so on. All this everyday levels. This is why, don't be mad at me, I will not draw a bad conclusion, but although, you know, in this big conflict between trans and so-called TERFs, trans exclusionary radical feminists, I of course agree with trans about how gender identities are constructed and so on, but I think TERFs have hit upon something on pointing out that, look, to be a woman today, concretely, it's not just, oh, some performative joke where I, let's say I am a man and I even don't have the decency to have my penis cut off, I just <laughs> put on feminine dresses, lipstick, and oh, oh, I am a woman. No, uh, let's, it's at the level of even biology and how this biology is part of our social practices that you get what femini femininity means. Let me be very vulgar, although it's not vulgar. Femininity means, my God, having periods, birth, it's easy for us men. Sorry for the vulgarity, but it's on purpose here. You screw a woman, then you say hello, goodbye, you know, and go. And then the woman has to go through all the painful process and mostly raising the child and so on. You see, the problem is not to become in an abstract sense feminist. The problem is how to dissolve, move over this uh, subordination of, feminine, of women embedded in daily practices. And so for me, it's not so much breaking out of ideology it's not so much about uh, seeing things as they truly are. The biggest point of breaking out of ideology is not seeing the truth, but in understanding how, I know this will be an abstract formula, but I believe in it, in how 
our reality itself reproduces itself through ideological misperceptions, mystifications, and so on and so on. I don't think, I think our social reality itself needs ideology to function. And this is what Marx, as I often developed, was discovering in his notion of so-called commodity fetishism. Commodity fetishism is, in some sense, an ideological misperception. But Marx never calls it ideology, because it's a part of the very material practice of capitalism. You see, so I would just, I know I didn't fully answer the question, I would just say, uh, when, don't ask directly how to get rid of ideology, ask yourself, rather, why does reality need ideology to reproduce itself. That's the key point. Reality itself needs illusions, and that's why we are coming back to your question. That's Barbie, you know. Uh, Barbie is <laughs> ideology, but, and so on. Okay. Right. I'm going to go over this way because I have denied this area. You. <laughs> coming. I hope I will hear you. Oh, yeah. Do you want to shout? No, I'll take the mic. Hello, um, how do I say this? Um, I, I partly apologize because this isn't something that has been actually in discussion during this event, but during the sort of summary at the beginning, part of the discussion points were the future of AI. Um, Artificial intelligence, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, sorry, I'm sorry. What are your thoughts particularly on cases of um, AI such as um, large uh, neural uh, networks and large language models, uh, specifically such as Google's Lambda AI that have been claiming sentience uh, within themselves. And ultimately, is your uh, thoughts on the future of AI something that artificial sentience could eventually be something that could come to into fruition? I, uh, it's difficult for me to give you a precise answer because, again, this is minimally a topic for another long Talk, so I can only give you sorry, a, a very general answer. I don't like this game of, I'm not accusing you of it, but generally in the debates on AI. You know, it's all about uh, we people are obviously limited. Will artificial intelligence become more intelligent than we are and so on? I to be as brief as possible. I don't see the problem of artificial intelligence in it being more bright than we, but in not being stupid in the way we humans can be. What I think is unique for us humans is to be stupid in a proper way, so that you make something or say something stupid, but then you, uh, get the message through this very stupidity, another dimension opens up to you. So I would rather say that, uh, of course, we have now already computers which, can, which are self-learning, change, adopt to rules, but they still take mistakes as something to be overcome. They don't see the, let's call it the, productivity, the capacity to open up a new space of the mistake as such. To make it a little bit clearer what I mean, uh, I, in my book on Hegel and the Wired Brain, I use these examples. It's a disgusting movie. I hate the actors, everybody, but you saw, I'm mean, afraid to mention it, four weddings at the funeral. <laughs> you know, but nonetheless, you know that scene when uh, Hugh Grant declares love to Andy McDowell, I think, and in his own fake way, he gets confused, uh, 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 stutters, blah, blah, blah. But in this way, he succeeds in declaring love. If he were to say it clearly, how he loves her, it would be a fake. So you see how the mistake as such 
renders the message. Now I enter a very complex domain of what? John Elster, a pretty good Norwegian uh, theorist of uh, rational action, calls states which are necessarily by-products. For example, I wrote about this in a text that was published in one of your philosophical monthly journals, Philosophy Now or what. Uh, if I say I have dignity, it's self-defeating. Because if I say this, it's ridiculous. I must show, display dignity through the way I act. And the same goes for many of our acts, which you cannot, it is self-defeating if you directly talk about them. At this level, I try to circumscribe something that maybe, at least the way things stand now, artificial intelligence, I think, cannot do. Again, I repeat, not because we humans are brighter, but because we humans learned to use in a productive way our stupidity, our limitation itself. But I'm sorry, maybe now it would be too much to, to, to go into this. What well, time for one more question? Ah, I like this. One more. Then fuck you. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Do you want to pick your last one? No. Ah, I love you. You just, I had, love you. You just had the tallest hand. Oh, cheers. Appreciate ah. it. Uh, hello. Yes? Hello. Pleasure, I don't see you. Pleasure sorry. to see you talk tonight. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Go to I'm the point. Wondering. I see when you are talking friendly like this, you are just sharpening the knife. I feel like you were actually. I feel, I feel like you were actually directing the last question at me because it was actually over there, but you were looking at me the whole time. <laughs> Wasn't even my question. Hmm. Uh, so what's the? <laughs> sorry. So, what's the question? Hello, hello, Mr. Zizek. Yeah. I'm just wondering, um, with, the, with, the, with the potential inevitability of what we've been told about the uh, beginning of the Third World War happening, uh, and, a bit, and some, you know, the, the potentiality of boots on the ground happening, do you think it is more morally justified to look at the involvement of British soldiers, or, I don't know, a lot of young men in this room, young women, young men as well, do you think it's more of a... Afghanistan, Iraq situation, or do you think it's more of a let's defeat the evil Second World War situation? Should I willingly enter the meat grinder? That's, uh, uh, but uh, you know what problem I have here? And you put it. Sentence, Jeremy Kyle. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it gets very, uh, it gets complicated for me because, for example, in my own country, Slovenia, when the Ukrainian war began, we get a lot of many pacifists who were saying, you know, uh, bringing soldiers or producing arms never brings peace and so on and so on. Now, precisely when this debate was going on, we celebrated, I don't know which anniversary of the partisan victory against Germans in World War II, no? And in some debate, I ask these people openly, is this that, you know, there, there are no victorious wars, every war is a tragedy and blah, 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 peace. Uh, is this a general statement or are you making uh, a particular case apropos Ukraine? Because if you make a general statement, then why not say when Germany attacked uh, France, let us say, let's stay out of the war, uh, 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 producing arms will never bring peace, and so on, and so on, and so on. So I'm just saying, I wonder if you agree already with my first point, that there are definitely cases, in spite of all the dangers that they will be misused for, further militarization and so on. But there are definitely cases where early resistance, <laughs> military resistance, counterattack, can prevent 
a much larger violence, death, and so on later. For example, I recently read a history of the beginning of World War II, which argues that it's a little bit pro-Stalinist motive, but I think there is an argument of truth in it. You know, when Czechoslovakia was under attack by the Germans in 38 already, Soviet Union, I don't know if it was a fake or not, and I'm no friend of Stalin, but offered the West, let's at defend Czechoslovakia together. Let's oppose the Germans. Immediately, let's go to war. And the West rejected this. And then it can be reasonably proven, without me in any way celebrating Stalin, that then Stalin got so afraid when he saw that the West really wants a war between Germany and Soviet Union so that they would exhaust each other and the West will just collect the wealth, whatever remains, that Stalin, I think he was here sincere, made a peace, that famous uh, agreement, Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, and now new documents show that Stalin was fully aware that there will be war. The reason Soviet Union was caught unprepared was that Stalin was in some sense more intelligent than Hitler or his Stalin's generals were <coughs> more intelligent. <coughs> they thought that, when did it begin? 22nd of June, the attack on Russia, that that it's that they are safe for this year, that if Hitler were to attack and defeat Russia, he should have done it at least one or two months earlier. So Stalin thought for this year, the danger is over. So unfortunately, maybe this is already too much for you. I, uh, I couldn't read clearly, because the way you put it at the last, should I offer my body to the meat grinder and so on and so on. Okay, this holds for every war. But what makes a difference when you said between, on the one hand, uh, uh, like World War II, evil, and on the other hand, the examples were of a, sorry? Yeah, my God, here, I'm sorry, things get really complicated for me. For example, what do you think about, now I will shock you, now you will get my right wing side. I know, I spoke with many friends, you know, when they said Ukrainian war is just a plot by NATO to expand itself. No, it is obvious already with Ukraine that NATO doesn't want those countries, Finland, uh, Baltic countries, they are scared like shit of the Russians. They want to join more than, more than the other side. And again, what I also oppose is this idea, I'm now trying to shock you, of NATO, the ultimate evil. So whoever is against NATO, there must be something a little bit good in him, you know, even if it's Putin. Sorry. All the time I'm listening to, not just Putin's speeches, but as, because I speak possibly a little bit Russian, Russian media and so on and so on. Listen, one thing is, and I've written many critical things. I will not bore you with it now about Ukraine. But sorry, this one thing is enough for me. I listened carefully to Putin's two speeches uh, two years ago. It's now already... 21st and 23rd of February, when he announced, began the invasion, the war. You know which name Putin mentioned, Putin explicitly mentioned there? Only one name, Lenin. He said Ukraine should be properly called Ukraine of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. He said Ukraine is a Bolshevik creation and we have to correct that historical error and so on and so on. So I'm just shocked when Putin is seen as some kind of uh, resistance here. Oh my God, read what he and his people are saying. I hope you will agree with me here if I tell you something else. They already say today, I don't think I did it, that uh, the most stupid uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh. anti-enemy proverb that I know is an enemy is somebody whose words or who, to whose story you were not ready to listen to. Sorry, this is the first thing I do. I read, you probably didn't, Hitler's my camp. And it didn't make me more tolerant when I listened to his words. It was even worse. And you see what I'm saying. Let's admit real, uh, real complexity. I, my answer to you would be that there is no abstract reply, yes or no. It depends on what war you are talking about and so on and so on. One has to be concrete here. You know, because never forget one thing. I'm provoking you now. Do you know that occupiers also are always sincerely pacifists? For example, after Germany occupied France in summer of 1940, I think, they were sincerely pacifists. They wanted peace because peace meant what? We keep France in peace and we exploit it nicely and so on and so on. And if somebody was an extreme militarist there, it was de Gaulle. His basic statement from emigration was, no, the, sec the war is not over. France will continue to resist. It's pure militarist in this sense statement. So all I'm saying, I'm ready to say now is there is no general rule. The world is full of uh, the world is full of crazy paradoxes. It's interesting that in Slovenia, uh, during World War II, this argument is it worth to go meet Grinder and so on was used by uh, uh, by pro-fascist collaborators who said we Slovenes are a small nation and every any kind of resistance against Germany would be suicidal. So it's in the interest of Slovene nation to safely wait for uh, Allied victory and strictly to do nothing. Maybe, in some sense, but it's, a, it's really a terrible deadlock. There is no abstract formula, I think so. I'm sorry if I disappointed you. Sorry? Uh, be serious, I mean. I am not satisfied with this, but the shit is real, you know what I mean? It's some bullshit of my own books. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so if anyone wants to buy books, then uh, I think hang around. What's the... Where will I be signing books? You'll be signing around here, this area. Uh, and so we'll be signing the, now. The people We've got enough coke to keep you going. No, 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 but... Okay, so I will rather then move maybe to this table or whatever. Okay. We've got it. We've okay. got it. Okay. Um, a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. DJ. Thank you very much. I hope, I hope you get, you got my old Stalinist joke, which I always repeat. I will repeat it again. Watch the speeches of, let's say, fascist leaders and Stalinist leaders. When there is applause, a fascist leader just receives the applause. The Stalinist leader joins the applause. <laughs> I'm on a Stalin side here. <laughs> um, sorry, I forgot to say, it's actually coming up to your birthday, I do believe. So I'd, so like, to, I'd like us all to join in. Um, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. My God, my God. <laughs> happy birthday. What did I do to you to deserve? It's nice. Did I did I rap your mother in public or I what? To to to. Uh, you know this was my. No. No, no, no. Thank you. Okay. Let's do the timing. Five minutes. Sorry, what five minutes? Books will be on the stage in five minutes. Books I'm gonna. Ah, books are where now?